Every year during Advent, we encounter in a rather formal way the great figure of John the Baptist, because in a certain sense, he gives personality to this whole time in the church's year. When you consider the vocation of the Baptist, he, through his penance, through his way of living a life totally given over to God, he became a prophet. And a prophet understood as the one whose vision was so clarified that he could see the Messiah, and he pointed him out once he saw him. Behold the Lamb of God. His entire life, in a certain sense, led up to that moment of proclamation, pointing out to the world who this man was. This is the Messiah. This is the Savior. This is the, the Son of God, the one whom we have expecting and been expecting for century after century. And there were some in his immediate circle that believed him. And there were many, many others who didn't. You know, there's that sense of the prophet's vocation to point out the truth. And the one who is all truth will often, very often, fall on deaf ears. The, the Lord, in, in, in taking up this, this um, you know, will say that there was no man born of woman greater than John the Baptist for the witness he gives to the truth. And yet this personality of this wild man of the desert really becomes the personality of all who have been called to this same prophetic vocation. That's you, that's me, that's all of us who have been baptized and filled with the very same spirit that filled and, to use the word, possessed John the Baptist. We are the ones who today are the forerunners of the Lord. We are the ones who today are meant to keep vigil and have our own vision purified by our prayer, by our penance, by our celebration of the sacred mysteries, so that we can see God coming, so that we can discern his presence in our own lives and in that of our family members and friends, and yes, point it out. Well, that's the Lord, you know, beyond, you know, it's our own way of saying Behold the Lamb of God. St. Luke's Gospel introduces this figure using this wonderful uh, image of John, the voice crying out. Now, here's probably, I should warn you, my mother was an English teacher for 47 years. I would count the end of Western civilization as we know it, the day that the New York Times started splitting infinitive and got rid of the Oxford comma. Commas are important. And you see that here. Because actually, what Luke uses as the definition of who this man is, he changes from the way that the same phrase is used in the prophet Isaiah. He moves the comma. And in moving the comma, we get two very different ways of reading this sentence and two very different ways of understanding the Baptist. Let's start with the one that we know probably the best. A voice crying out in the wilderness... Prepare the way of the Lord. Because that that seems to be exactly what we're talking about, right? That, you know, this idea of the truth falling on deaf ears. The idea that the culture in which we live is kind of hostile, even, to the truth of God in Christ. Particularly when it comes down to, you know, having something to say about how you live your life. You know, the idea of the moral teaching of the church and things like this has always kind of pushed against, mm, we would want to call them natural inclinations, but the reality is they're unnatural inclinations because all sin is not what God intended. It is not the nature for which we have been made. So part of naming Christ, part of declaring his truth day in and day out, will be calling the world to some sort of conversion. And sometimes it can feel like our voice is going out into a howling desert out there, into a wilderness that isn't ever interested at all in hearing necessarily that the way of life and the way to actual, lasting, even eternal happiness is following in the way that Christ marks out for us. And Christ marks out for that way for us by dragging his cross. And so this whole kind of, 
then what, you know, this is the opening of the gospel. The rest of the gospel about taking up your cross and following that, becoming his disciples, will mean precisely living differently. And there's a daunting thing about that, to understand that there is no such thing as a private vocation. And there's no such thing as a person who has been baptized without a vocation. So in some way, some shape, or some form, our vocation is to be the voice that cries out into the wilderness and say, no, prepare the way of the Lord. Because he came as an infant, as an infant born at Bethlehem. They were, we're preparing for that great celebration of the nativity. But when he comes again in glory to judge the living and the dead, there ain't no missing him. And you want to kind of be on the right side of that. Some way, we are the ones who are the prophets of precisely that message. But I say that St. Luke moved the comma when he's quoted this, the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. The way that that same description of the Lord's anointed in the prophet Isaiah is written goes like this, a voice of one who cries out, comma, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. In the wilderness is where you prepare the way of the Lord. And then the way that that whole, you know, prophet Isaiah develops the thing, you know, it's a much more inward-looking thing. Because, of course, the wilderness means something to the Jews. Because, of course, it brings them right back to the 40 years in the desert, where they learned who God was, where they learned who they were, through some very painful experience. The wilderness is the place of isolation. The wilderness is a place of danger. The wilderness is the place of vulnerability. And the, the wilderness is the place of God's closeness. It isn't in comfort. It isn't in security. But when we go into those places, and we all have them, in our lives where we feel most afraid and vulnerable and broken and wounded, expecting those are the least likely places to find God because we don't want to go there. Why would God want to go there? In fact, those are the places of God's particular closeness. If we open them in humility and in longing before the Lord, it is there that he will reveal himself to us most powerful. It is there that he writes his law on our hearts. It is there he leads us as the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Don't overlook those areas of your life that scare you. The relationships that are broken, those senses, those places of weakness those places where we feel exposed. Israel had to learn in the wilderness where literally everything and everyone around them wanted to kill them, that in fact that is where God was most active. And that will be true for us in our own discipleship as well. And part of being the prophet to take on the personality of this prophetic spirit is a certain fearlessness about that, a certain habit of when we hit up against those places in our lives, not to ignore them, but precisely bring them now before God's grace. Bring them into the sacrament of confession. Bring them into Mass. Place those parts of our lives on the altar and ask God to transform them. And he will, because that's where he will be closest to us. And then, tell somebody about it. And then give witness to what the Lord has done. The spirit of John the Baptist must breathe freely in the church today if we are going to be about a good advent. Because make no mistake about it, the Lord is coming. A day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. We don't know when, but the Lord is coming. Watch, pray, and point him out when you see him.